arriving in Tanziria. Samuel was the first to wake the next morning. His first thought was how his lips felt on Rose's cheek. He had been nervous to try it, but it had felt right when he finished and moved away from her. He had noticed how strongly she had started to blush and took that as a good sign. He remembered the way it felt when she had put her paw in his and how he had squeezed it. The warmth that came from the palm and stretched along his fingers made him smile. He folded the blanket back off of himself and sat up in the tent. He checked on the lantern near the head of the tent and saw that Chibri was deeply asleep, the light pulsating slightly, as though she was breathing, between the cracks in the curtain. She's a heavy sleeper when she wants to be, he thought to himself. He then thought again of kissing Rose. Hopefully she wasn't put off by it, he thought. He chided himself for perhaps being too forward with her, but she did grab his paw first, and did he remember her squeezing his paw back when he had done that to her? He thought he had. He pushed the worrying thought from his mind and got up and out of the tent. He went to the fire and got it going again and saddled up to it to get the chill from the night so near to the ground away from him. He was warming his paws when Barkland came out of his tent. Morning, Samuel, he said amicably. Morning, Barky, replied Samuel. They sat together for a while, warming around the fire. Then Barkland moved back to his tent and came out with his tin pot and two smaller mugs for the two of them. He filled it from his water skin and put the pot on to boil. He had brought out the small sack of dandelion whiskers and was adding them to the pot as it started to roil. They sat and listened to the fire crackle and the water boil and the, as the steam from the brewing tea rolled upwards into the sky. It was pleasantly quiet. Birds chirped in the trees not far from them, and the morning breeze played through the branches of the trees near them, rustling the leaves. They enjoyed the moment's respite while they waited for the others to wake. Soon after, Rose woke up. She came out carrying her mug and walking over to the two of them. She blushed when Samuel looked at her and tried unsuccessfully to hide a smile as she walked past them. They exchanged glances and Samuel raised his eyebrows on the How are you doing? indication. Rose closed her index finger over her thumb and made a small OK symbol and smiled at him. Samuel grinned and let out a small breath of air. He was relieved. It seemed that the kiss was enjoyed. Rose sat down next to him and moved in close. Barkland took no notice of her new appreciation for Samuel and poured her a cup of tea. He then went back into the tent and found the last of the scones wrapped up in their cloth napkin. He placed them near the fire and let them warm as he went over at Averly's tent and woke her up. It's time to get up, Averly, said Barkland. There was no response. He tried again. Averly, Averly, it's time to get up, he said, shaking the tent gently as he spoke. There was a faint rustling from beneath the canopy as Averly stretched out. All right, all right, I'm up, she said. Barkland came back down to the others and sat down. A few minutes later, Avery crawled out of her tent with her cup in her paw. She walked up to the others and plodded down next to Barkland. She hadn't slept well that night. She had dreamt of the hare and what he would do to her if he found or caught her. It had kept playing over and over. It, it wouldn't stop. He kept finding her. No matter where she ran or, or what she did, he always found her. The others in the group grinning maliciously as they closed in on her. She had woken again and again each time they caught her, just as his paw was about to go for her throat throughout the night. She had bags under her eyes and she looked slightly dazed as she turned to Barkland and held out her cup. May I have some tea, please? she asked. Barkland pulled the pot from the fire and poured her a large helping of the dandelion tea. It had been burning for a while and came out nearly green as he poured. Her cup shook gently as she held it out to him. She thanked him as he finished pouring and took a large sip of tea. The warmth of it steadied her as she sat and thought again about the paw tightening around her throat. She blinked a few times and tried to clear her head. It made it only marginally better. Avery looked down at the fire pit where the scones were resting on stones, warming near the embers. She reached down and grabbed one of the scones from its resting place and put it to her mouth. She chewed without tasting. Berklin stared at her. Are you all right, Averly? He asked, perplexed. He had noticed how her paw had shaken while he poured her the tea, and the small bags under her eyes made it clear she hadn't had a good night. Avery chewed for a while wordlessly, swallowed, and then turned to Berklin. I just had some bad dreams about Valderon and my old gangmate, she said. They kept capturing me and hurting me no matter what I did, she shouted gently. She reached up and started to rub her neck tenderly. Is your neck all right? asked Rose. Averly stopped. Oh, yes, I suppose, replied Averly. She removed her paw from around her throat. She hadn't realized she was doing that and smiled slightly embarrassed. She finished her tea and asked, for, and asked Barkland for another cup. He poured her one dutifully. I'm all right. I think once we get to the town and get to the Amsterdam's house, I'll feel much better. I'm feeling on edge. I think he spooked me last night and stuck in my dreams to torment me, said Averly reassuringly. The others looked at her worried. They had no idea what kind of animal Valderon was, but if he did this much to someone just seeing him for a few seconds, then he had to be a bad hare. Remember, said Barkland, we've got your back as long as you're with us. You're with friends now, so you don't have anything to worry about as long as we all pay attention. Avery smiled at them. She liked it when they used the word friend in regard to her. She had heard it so infrequently growing up that each time she heard it, it cheered her up a little. Can you tell us what to look out for with regards to the others in the group? asked Samuel. Every stared into her tea for a moment and then began speaking. 
Well, Feldron stays with the carriage whenever he can. He doesn't like to leave it because that's where he keeps us safe and where he likes to drink away his earnings during the day. There are four others traveling with him in the gang. He raised all of them, just like me. We would share bunks while he would drive us through the night to the next area. Two mice, brothers named Hammond and James. Two small gray field mice that like to pick pockets for him. There's also David, the oldest of the group. And the largest, he lost an eye a few years ago when Veltron lost his temper and, and wears a red eye patch over it. He's a mean one. There's also Heather. She's the toad that is able to hide what she steals by stuffing the contraband into her cheeks and under her tongue. She's gotten us out of a few scrapes with the authorities by doing that. The gang color is red, and they'll all be wearing a red bandana somewhere on their body. The brothers around their necks, Heather around her wrist, and David wears it folded as his eye patch, as I said said Averly. She took a moment to take a breath and another sip of her tea. She bit into her scone and continued on with the story. Heather's all right. She only does it to eat and does her best to stay out of Valderon's way. She learned early on that you don't question him or you'll get a whack upside the head. David's the worst. The brothers adore him and follow everything he says. They look up to him and try to emulate what he does. And when they're together, it's hard to get a word in edgewise. And if you cross David, the other two are liable to rat you out to Valderon to get you, get you in trouble. I remember once that I fumbled a mark in front of the two of them. They were grinning at me and they knew I'd messed up and ran off to David to tell him what had happened. Valderon didn't take it kindly. I'd lost him something valuable and took it out of me pretty quickly. David and the others just watched as he struck me. But Heather had the decency to comfort me afterwards. There was another in our group, but I'd rather not talk about him if I don't have to, said Averly. Rose and the others nodded at her, taking a shaky breath. She continued, he and Heather are my only family. And she wiped away a tear that had formed at the corner of her eye. It was hard for me to leave her all alone, and when I'm and I'm sure Veldron hurt her when they couldn't find me. But I had to leave. I just had to. Couldn't do that kind of stuff anymore. Couldn't live like that any longer. She put the tea down and wiped both of her eyes. The others listened to her frowning. Brooklyn came up to her and started to rub her back, trying to comfort her. It's all right. You got out of there. Maybe we'll get lucky and see her, your sister while she's in town. Samuel nodded. He's right. If we can help her, we, we will said Samuel. They sat there for a while in silence as Averly continued to wipe her eyes. She looked up at the others and thanked them. You're my first friends I've ever had, said Averly. Rose went over to her, smiling reassuringly. You're our friend, Averly. We're glad to have you with us, said Rose, squeezing her shoulders kindly. Averly cried for a little while longer and continued wiping her eyes and said, Thank you. Thank you so much. She dried her eyes as best she could and snorted gently. She started to laugh and snorted again, this time harder and louder. She broke out into a bout of laughter. She looked down at her clenched fists. I can't believe I got away from him, the dirty old hair, she said, smell creasing the corner of her mouth. I finally got one over on him and got away. She picked up the rest of her scone and bit into it, enjoying the taste of the warm dough. With that stone, I'm sure I can help Heather, she said. Maybe I can find you too, brother, she thought to herself. Her smile broke into a grin that covered her whole face as she thought about it, and the other smiled back at her, glad to see that she was okay. So what's the plan for today, then, she asked, taking another mouthful of scone and washing it down with a large sip of tea. Samuel thought for a moment before speaking. We're going to take you up to the Ambassador's house first so you can get your trinket sorted. Then Rose and I will head over and get the message sent off to our parents. While we're taking care of that, you and Barton can see what you can find at the library, said Samuel. Okay, that'll work, replied Averly. They finished their breakfast and cleared away the camp, working quickly and quietly as they broke down the tents and readied their backpacks. They set off down the road with renewed vigor and a sense of urgency they didn't notice the night before. They walked all morning, not stopping to eat or rest until they came up to the sign that read Tanzeria one mile north. They were almost there. Rose had to tell herself that she couldn't really see it just yet, and she was just being impatient and imagining the edge of the town, but she could feel how close they were to their destination and sped up her pace to match how she felt. The others kept up with her, excited to finally see where they were headed. As they walked and got closer to the town, the forest broke away into rough fields, fenced with large split logs to keep the forest away from the usable farmland. Small houses dotted the fields, and animals were out working the land with tools and paw alike. A family of field mice were bent over a large tract of raised dirt, planting seeds in unison, overtaking each other in synchronized movements from a lifetime of similar work. Barkland waved at the family as they passed through. A male mouse in a straw hat straightened up with his arms behind him, stretched his back against the morning sun. He noticed Barkland and waved back. Good morning, he yelled from the field as the travelers passed by him and, and his family. Morning, shouted Barkland as the others moved on. They kept going, sparing no time to chat. The farm led away to clearings of divided housing in tiny neat rows and columns on each side of the road. The pathway broke off into hard-packed dirt roads between the rows of houses, and children ran between them playing with each other. Some of them would stop and stare as the group made their way through. Others would ignore them completely, too wrapped in what they were doing to notice them. The group moved on until the streets started becoming paved with stones, and the quality of the roads improved. 
Sammy noticed that they had gutters built into each side of the road to allow wastewater to travel through when it rained and that they were sizably wider than the dirt roads they'd passed earlier in the morning. They reached the town walls, wide stone structures topped by large metal braziers just before noon that day. Look at the size of them, exclaimed Burroughs. She measured them with her eyes, scanning the length of them. They had to be at least 30 feet tall by her estimate, unscalable by just about all but the most dedicated animal. The gates to the town were open. The arched doorways were held in place by pulleys and thick chain that led below the street into grates, where large spoked wheels had been set up at ground level and locked into place, allowing the doors to be opened and closed with minimal effort. The number of animals passing through the doorway caught her attention. What looked to be hundreds of animals roamed the streets between the open doorway. Lines of carriages passed in both directions, some turning down the path or coming up behind them from the houses they had passed. They walked into the city unnoticed by the hundreds surrounding them. Animals passed by them, carrying on with their lives. Some carried packages. A couple of otters walked by them, the male carrying a stack of ribbon-tied boxes that reached up to his brimmed hat and festive paper bags around his arms. He followed a female otter in a lace yellow and white dress who covered herself with her parasol as she walked. The poor otter almost bumped into Averly as he walked. Look out, said Averly, ducking out of the way at the last moment. The boxes swayed frighteningly as the otter attempted to regain control of his load. Sorry! He called back from behind the stack as he walked on, increasing his pace to catch up with his date. They walked on as though nothing had happened. The group gathered themselves in the center of the town and walked over to the edge where the other animals kept themselves walking along the cobbled paths to allow safe passage of the carriages that passed by them. A tram full of otters and brown work clothes and billed hats pulled lower the heads came running by them as the group barely made their way onto the pathway. The tram operator, a black and white spotted pig, dinged the bell by his side repeatedly. Out of the way, folks, he exclaimed as the tram passed by them at breakneck speed. That was close, said Barkland, letting out a large breath of air. <sighs> we're going to have to pay more attention while we're here, said Rose watching the tram speed off into the distance, disappearing as it turned right a few streets up. Samuel scanned the area until he found what he was looking for. Over there, he exclaimed, pointing. That's what we need to go to figure out where we are. A large wooden structure had been set up across the intersection diagonally from where they were standing. Under its A-frame tilted roof, a large map had been glued to the wooden display. Dozens of animals milled underneath it, looking up where they were and where they wanted to go. A small wooden building had been set up next to it, and inside racks of rolled paper could be seen. A gray spotted owl stood inside and was helping an old badger look over one of the papers he had purchased. A large sign with red lettering painted on it read, Maps Available. A small sign on the right of the owl read, One silver coin apiece. The group waited at the corner of the intersection underneath two gas lamps that burned above them. The upper lamp glowed red, its painted windows obscuring the flame within, as the animals waited for the traffic to slow. A few minutes later, the red lamp stopped glowing, and the green lamp below it lit up. The other pair of lamps across the street did the same in unison. Averly checked to make sure the traffic had stopped in both directions and then started to cross the street. The others followed. They waited and did the same at the other corner as the traffic resumed and stopped in the opposite direction. Barklin walked up to the large map hanging overhead and tried to make sense of it. He found the doorway they had passed through and saw that the store they stood next to had been marked in large red inked X and the phrase, You're here, buy a map. He could see that the city spread out in vast, intricate roadways with hundreds of buildings drawn between the roads. He traced the main road up to the large building at the city's epicenter. Tanzeria Castle was written in the same red script within its walls. He noted other places of interest marked similarly. The city was broken into sections of different colored ink. He tracked his way through the town until he found the section that contained the Amberstone's house, just below the name marking it as Old Town in dull orange ink, denoted as a small rectangle. He remembered back to the instructions Samson and Tamas had given him and tracked the route through the town. The directions he had been given were perfectly clear. As Barkland did this, Averly and the others stood in line before the owl stand and waited for their turn to purchase a map. The owl finished with the badger before them. Thank you, sir. Have a lovely day, said the owl. Rose and the others walked up to the window and stared inside. On every wall were racks of rolled maps. The areas within arms reached to him were empty from previous sales that day. The owl looked them over, beaming at the three of them, his large silver eyes glistening. Averly spoke up. We'd like two maps, please, she said. Samuel looked at her. Do we need two of them? He asked. One for each pair of us so we don't get lost, she replied. That makes sense, replied Rose. The owl reached behind him and grabbed two of the rolls of paper. He brought them outward and placed them on the counter, his large feathered wing covering most of the paper protectively. Averly reached into her blouse and pulled the small sack of coins from around her neck. From this, she removed two silver pieces and handed them to the owl. He tapped them on the counter, listening to their sound, and tucked them into his shirt pocket. He handed Averly the maps. Thanks for your business, he said, smiling at them. They moved over to Barkland, who was still studying the map on the wall in front of him. Samuel tapped him on the back, and he turned towards him. I figured out where we need to go, said Barkland. He had pulled his pencil out from his pouch 
around his neck. Pass me the map and I'll make the pathway we need to take, he said. We bought two of them so we could figure out where we were once we were split up for the day, said Averly. Great idea, said Barglin. He held out his paw to take the two maps from her. Averly handed them over to him. He walked over to the stone wall behind them stand and unfurled the maps flat against the wall. He held the instructions from Samson with his left paw and with his pencil traced the route from the stand to the Amberstone's house. He swapped the maps around and did the same for the second one. Rolling the second one, he handed it to Rose. She tucked it away in her jacket as he rolled up the first one, holding it in one paw. Shall we get going then, he asked the others. They moved back to the crosswalk they had just been to and waited for their lamps to change color. They passed block after block, cutting through the city. They passed under a stone archway built into a wall in the same height as the others that surrounded the city. Old Town had been dug into the stones hanging overhead. The architecture of the area changed. What had been collections of wooden and stone stores changed to brick and smaller masonry stone buildings. The roads became flat stone instead of the raised cobbles of the section of town they had just come from, which Barclay found was called Merchant's Alley, even though it took up blocks and blocks of space within the city's wall. The animals changed too. The clothing took on a finer and more well-fitting look. Mothers could be seen marching their children behind them down the pathways in single file, heading to schools and shops in the surrounding districts. The carriages moved more slowly down the streets here too, and there was no sign of carriages like the merchants at sections of town. It took them 30 minutes to find the brick and stone house in the middle of the street. They stood before it for a long time, waiting to knock on the door. The house was massive. At least three stories that stretched up as far as the eye could see. Only the clouds were visible over the curved tile roof. Wow, said Rose. I've never seen houses so big as this. It's almost as large as the tavern, said Barkland, staring upwards. He was impressed with its size and well-laid foundation. It was a very pretty house. He looked down the street in both directions. They all were. Barkland moved up the brick steps and came to the red door of the house. He scanned the door until he found what he was looking for, and he rang the doorbell. It echoed into rooms within the house. After a few minutes, the door opened and a wombat before them, his round face staring back out at them. May I help you folks? asked the wombat. Are you Jeffreys? asked Barklin, looking up into the dark black eyes that stared back at him from behind gold rimmed spectacles. Why, yes, yes I am, replied Jeffreys. How may I help you? he asked amicably. The others walked up the steps and stood at the entrance to the house. Rose moved next to Barklin. It's about Samson, Tamas, and the other children, she said. They're in trouble and could use your help. The parents have gone missing, piped Samuel behind the two of them. Jeffreys' eyes opened wide. He stepped to the side of the door and raised his arm to a side facing the inside of the house. Please come in, he said hurriedly. The travelers made their way into the house. Jeffrey closed the door behind them with a click and turned to face them. What do you mean Reginald and Ashley have gone missing? He asked the group. Just that, replied Rose. They went walking one night and disappeared into the forest. Other than some signs of magic, there were no markings to show where they'd gone off to. Thomas and Sansa had been looking after the others for the last year without any luck of finding them. Buckland stepped forward into the foyer. That's not all. We've got much to discuss, he said. Jeffreys scowled at the badger. Very well, said Jeffreys. You had best come with me. He led them through the foyer and into a large dining room with an oval table that matched the one in the fort, but to a much larger scale. Fine silver candlesticks that adorned the length of a table atop a white linen tablecloth. He motioned for them to sit. They sat, spreading out around one edge of the table. I'll get you something to eat while you rest, he said. Judging by how dusty your clothes are, you must have been walking for days to get here. He moved out of the room and disappeared into the house. They sat quietly and stretched their legs underneath the table as they waited. Do you think I should ask him about the trinket? asked Avery, slightly nervous. I think you should wait until we can get their family sorted before we get into that, replied Samuel. Avery nodded. All right, that is the more important part, she said, looking down at the table. Jeffries returned to the dining room, pushing a silver metal cart with two heavy metal trays on it. Samuel turned as he came into the room, checking to see what were on the trays. On one were sandwiches cut in half, the other a larger flagon of what looked to be honey-colored liquid. Watercress and cucumber sandwiches and apricot mead, said Jeffreys, wheeling the cart to where Averly was sitting at the end. A small stack of white china plates and mugs rested next to the trays. He took one of each of these and placed it in front of him in, on the cart. Using silver tongs, he placed two of the half sandwiches on the plate and poured the honey-colored mead into the mug next to it. With two white glove paws, he placed these in front of Averly. He moved along to where Rose was sitting and did the same. He moved the cart to the edge of the room, placing it in the corner near a small table with a vase full of yellow flowers on it. He turned back to the table and set a few seats away from Samuel so he could see them all properly. As he sat down, placing his paws in front of him, closing them gently around each other, he said, You'd better tell me what you know about the children. I've got to make sure they're safe where they are while I make arrangements to get them back up here. Please visit 
anchor.fm slash divergent mind to leave a message so that I may get back to you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Hey, people, take a listen to the Divergent Mind podcast. You get both insight into living with a mental, a serious mental illness and get to listen to a lovely tale about a journey cute little animals need to take. Don't miss out. And remember, divergent minds don't need to think alike. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that I have a YouTube channel called Taught Myself, and that I've decided to start selling merch already with a phrase that my brother showed me saying, my disability is invisible, of which I made a hat for myself. So I decided to make hats, shirts, hoodies uh, for both men and women on Spreadshirt.com. All you have to do is search for, my disability is invisible. It's in green, and that's mine. You'll know it's me because when you click the sale icon, the same little divergent mind icon comes up. And I hope you support me. I make about $5 per shirt or per sale. Everything else goes to Spreadshirt. But that's okay because it's still a better deal than a lot of other places. And I really hope you'll support me. Come check me out on the YouTube. Teach me how to do that properly so I can have a community there too. And I await your response. Have a lovely day. Jay. So Anchor is asking me to ask you to support me financially. I would ask that you go to my Patreon to do that, which is patreon.com slash divergentmind. It means you can either become a monthly subscriber at a different tier of one to three to five dollars. I'm not looking for a lot. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm not asking for anything. This is going to go to the end of my podcast. I don't like it when podcasts straight up ask you for money when I'm doing okay. Well, I'm not doing okay. I'm surviving now to the point that I can make this. I would love to be able to make improvements to this by, say, getting... So basically, I'm running off an iPad, and I would like to improve it by getting... uh, different things that would make it better maybe some some headphones that monitor output or a better mic though the mic i got was from jwife so i might not even use the better mic you know what i mean it's all about it's all about whatever i need at the time but really it's just to get healthy again because i'm currently over 300 pounds and i don't want to die that young i would really like to be able to afford some vegetables So I can go back to my vegetarian diet. Because being this big sucks. And I'm happy to sit in a chair all day. But I really got to walk my butt off, literally. So that's what the money would be for. It would be for healthy food. Because I can't afford it. I can afford ramen and pasta and rice and beans. But I can't live on carbs. Because that's how you get this big on antipsychotics. Junk food and carbs, which is cheap and plentiful around me. So I would like to leave my house and just lose some weight. And to do that, I would like to go to the store and buy some vegetables, please. But you don't have to do anything. I'm not asking you to. I'm not begging. I'll figure it out on my own. Much pleasure. Jay.